morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you here this evening. Um, I'm really excited because we have an extremely esteemed group of panellists here. We're going to obviously talk about um, how firms can maximise the potential of e-commerce to be a global driver of, of trade and global growth as well. We've got perspectives from Australia, Indonesia, China. So really ex uh, looking forward to a very exciting discussion. Okay, so the first question I want to direct at all of you, which I'm sure a lot of people in the audience want to know, is when it comes to running a business, an e-commerce business, what can governments do to support you guys? We'll start with you, James. It's a, for Didi, it's a very, I want to give you a brief introduction of my company. Didi is a very young company with only four years old. And uh, we started from like, uh, 150 thousand US dollars, uh, US dollars, and now the market value is about uh, 35 billion US dollars. It's only take, it only takes four years. But why is DD? Why can DD develop, grow so fast? Because the, we, we, we believe the policy is the most important the factor. Actually, in China, uh, the, the right hiring the service is a uh, legally confirmed by the, nation, the, nation, the central government. So China is the, the, one, the number one country in the world give, giving the, the right hiring service the legal status. So the, the policy is uh, very important. That, uh, we, we can say that because, because the open and the, 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 the innovation policy uh, promoted by the central government so the DD get the chance to, to grow so fast. Maggie, has that been your experience as well as one of the veteran founders of Alibaba? The support from the Chinese government, has that been a big part of what has helped you guys? In my opinion, um, government doing nothing is the best support. Oh, that's <laughs> complete opposite opinion. But <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, but it was true. It was true. When Alibaba was created in 1999, actually e-commerce in China is a newborn baby. So no one from government knew how to support e-commerce. So actually, so you know, Alibaba was created in Hangzhou, Zhejiang province, and the Zhejiang government was very open-minded. So they let the, 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 the business grow naturally. And then, just when, when we grew up, and they found that, that uh, what the obstacles we need to solve. Mm. So that's why Alibaba now can grow so fast. Mm. Right, like you've got businesses, e-commerce, you run it very successfully here as well as in China. How would you compare and contrast the two experiences in terms of policy? Well, I think that China are definitely leading the way in policy in this area. And going back four or five years ago, we actually looked to trade in China and... It was too difficult for an international organisation to do it then, yeah. and, and we chose a different path, but that gave us some great tools to eventually come back to China through a route now where they're the most developed globally in, in, in a market that encourages free trade, yeah. in, it enables people to access brands globally, efficiently, with the delivery service that's happening two times a day. It's a completely different world to, to what we, we live in here in Australia. It's the future of retail uh, globally, and, and China are definitely leading the way. Ahmed, in your opinion, what's holding Australia back, and what's China doing so well? Um, look, uh, different, uh, completely different uh, positions um, of uh, strengths and weaknesses between the two markets. But uh, I, I do think there is a unique opportunity that... Um, uh, particularly the Asian governments with the Australian government have um, under uh, EWTC. The World Trade Organization is, uh, they're putting together a framework and cross-border e-commerce in uh, Asia is about a trillion dollar market. Uh, globally, it's about two trillion and roughly one trillion uh, in Asia alone. And it's growing at approximately 20% per annum. So clearly cross-border e-commerce is a major, major opportunity. What governments um, are starting to do and starting to think about is what Maggie was saying earlier, is the infrastructure that exists to govern and ensure that it can continue to grow in a safe, secure, reliable way. 
governments always look at taxes, and when they impose taxes and duties and so forth, it can create huge inefficiencies in the in the supply chain. And so being um, careful where they tax, how they tax, how they collect their taxes is one example, but also putting in place um, rules and regulations about, for example, customs clearance and what, and what data sits behind the customs clearance. And so the whole supply chain needs to be significantly more efficient than what it is today. And government policies and procedures in all the Asian markets, if they get that right and get the settings right, for example, I'll give you a very simple challenge in, in cross-border e-commerce between China, Australia, Indonesia, any, any of these countries. When somebody in Australia buys something from China and, and they do the order online, it's okay if, if it goes one way, but what happens on returns? Um, say you pay duty, um, how do you do a return in an efficient and an easy way and how do you get your tax back as well? So these policies and procedures that are put in place um, for cross-border interaction really involve, have to involve governments, but they also involve the e-commerce players coming together with government to ensure that we have the most efficient means to encourage what is uh, going to be one of the fastest growing segments in the business world. That is a really good point. Scott, I'd like you to weigh in on that. I mean, you've got a really good, strong fintech background. What, what, what can we do to, to maximise these efficiencies? Well, there's probably two parts of this. One is within the countries of Asia and the other is connecting the countries of Asia. Within the countries of Asia, to really unleash the competitive spirit for disruptors, we need to be able to have a transfer of value and a knowledge of identity which doesn't require a physical interface something so that you can make payments and prove who you are without having to go to something that you hold. And that's a big step, but it is something that we're looking at. Indeed, technology like blockchain is able to, to perform that. But then the next step is that's got to be interoperable, and this is exactly what Armand just explained. It's, it's got to be interoperable in a way, not just that the different <coughs> country systems need to work together, they need to work with their other systems as well, which gets to the point of, you shouldn't need to call a lawyer. I know that's kind of weird for a lawyer to say, but the, the idea of interoperability in international trade is if you have to pay customs duty, if you have to return the product, you shouldn't need to call someone like me. The system should already be built in to do that. That would create an ability for people to compete, not on the platform, but on the value they provide. And at the moment, what we have, because we have different countries and different systems, People are competing on the very framework. They should compete on the value that they can provide to consumers. Kusum, I'd like you to weigh in. We're talking about Asian countries. We've spoken about China, but what's it like in Indonesia? How much support do e-commerce platforms, e-commerce businesses have from the <coughs> Indonesian government? What are the regulations like there? Yeah, um, I don't know how many people here are really aware or really familiar with what the Indonesia is. I think you, you've seen it on the media, right? 255 million people, everything looks great, right? But I think in reality, like, um, e-commerce is it's kind of nascent in Indonesia. It was new. Like, ourselves, we started five years ago, and like any other industries, when, when you start new, right? Both the players and the government were both clueless, okay? The government didn't know what to do, how to, uh, to manage the uh, the sector, and we, the players, we, we we still, you know, that time we we were trying to think like, is it the 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 model of Amazon in in uh, U.S. that might work in Indonesia, or is it the uh, the Alibaba model in China that might work in Indonesia? So things been progressing. Um, the government initially was saying that oh yeah, because e-commerce is going to be big, we're going to put more tax on it. Mm. Right? So we said get off, okay. Don't touch it. We haven't even started, okay? <laughs> Just, you know, the first year and you're trying to put more tax on it. So uh, the good thing, finally, the government understood and they kind of let the industry uh, grow by itself. And actually last month, um, the central government just create an, a new economic policy uh, focusing on how they're gonna support the e-commerce, especially on the infrastructure on the data security, uh, cyber security, consumer protection. So those, those are good, but um, 
there are a lot of things that you know the government can do better obviously in terms of infrastructure mm -hmm. right the accessibility um, the interconnectivity I mean if we look at US right uh, or Australia it's very mature right but it's a one big blob of island sorry also in China yeah. right in Indonesia you're talking about 13,000 island and so much water in between think about the logistic right it's a nightmare one directions from the uh, the west part of Indonesia where a lot of the uh, the producers are going into east what they gonna bring the uh, back from the east part of Indonesia like to, uh, to Jakarta or to the west part so the logistic is quite inefficient mm. the cost is really high we are aware of the fact that China is, of course, a leader when it comes to e-commerce. Yeah. Where do you guys see the next tier of, um, of markets? Where, where, where is the next e-commerce growth going to come from? Uh, the groceries and food market in this country is not as developed from an e-commerce point of view um, as you've seen in countries like, say, take Japan. Uh, Japan, 30% of the Japanese uh, e-commerce um, transactions that occur are food and groceries related, whereas in Australia it would be less than 10%. And so you're seeing now with the rise of infrastructure um, and delivery capabilities with appropriate, um, um, with appropriate uh, forms of uh, you know, transportation, uh, this is an area you've heard Amazon are thinking about coming into the Australian market. Uh, this year, next year sometime, and groceries is an area. You've heard West Farmers talk about that. So clearly this is a big area. But I would say one comment, and I'll just put it out there. Um, I'm still somewhat surprised, uh, if I can be critical of our country, how poorly we have taken advantage of the trillion dollars of cross-border buying of e-commerce from Australia to the rest of Asia. Small businesses um, have been benefited with a 75 cents to the US dollar exchange rate versus a dollar, dollar 10. So it's a 30, 40% reduction in the price uh, of purchasing Australian goods. Mm. But yet, for whatever reason, um, Australian small businesses still tend to be domestically focused. Megan, I saw you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd like to take that opportunity, Del, thank you. I think part of the reason I completely agree with what Ahmed's saying, there's such lost opportunity, is fear of the unknown. And, and this is where governments really can help, that need for speed, that connectivity with Wi-Fi. Um, the legal, you know, the, 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 it takes four to six months sometimes to get the legal documentation that can thwart, um, you know, speed to market, it can thwart the entrepreneurial zeal. Um, and this is, you know, forums like this that are very pertinent to introducing, make, building those relationships. But also I think there's an opportunity for governments to establish um, something called landing pads, in perhaps via universities, um, internationally, so within you know all of the countries where people can simply land and be informed and upskilled in the localization, you know the, the platforms, <coughs> WeChat versus Facebook, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in different countries, um, relationships, SMEs, um, you know people who are prepared to invest and support SMEs as well. It's very hard in foreign countries to actually get that support. So it could actually be that speed to market, that assistance, and that's upskilling all of us, everyone benefits. Each country benefits, the entrepreneurs benefit, the investors benefit, you know, the governments need to take a, you know, the, the shift from industrial economy to the consumer-led economy. Governments need to be far more entrepreneurial in their thinking, and that means hiring. Um, you know, understanding the zeitgeist and hiring accordingly, that intergenerational hire and that enabling, as big incumbent companies have had to do, um, to change their thinking. The, you know, silos no longer exist, the rigidity of a hierarchy shouldn't exist. Listening to, you know, people who used to be stuck out the back in technology, bringing them right up to the front and, and in marketing, the importance of marketing and just shifting the way of thinking that it just takes a different, and it's exciting. The interesting point that was also made was, of course, uh, Damien and Radek, you were just, you know, both your companies are the exception, not the rule, when it comes to success stories of e-commerce in Australia. What have you guys been able to do? Has it just been sheer size? Has it been sheer money? What, what, what has been 
Why have you guys succeeded where others, small SMEs, can't? Uh, we, we're called Swiss, so we, it's very hard for us to say we're Australian. Uh, <laughs> we're very proud of our Australian heritage. Um, so, but we've always thought global in our mindset. And as a result of that, you know, we've always thought global in the type of activities that we've brought together to promote our brand. And that global uh, mindset, whether it's uh, partnering with the, the Olympic team or partnering with properties like a, a Nicole Kidman, uh, whilst they're, they're, they're quite popular here and help us in other, other markets like the US and so forth, or Europe, it's really helped us in China, but not so much with the consumer. It's helped us with connecting with the opinion leaders, helped those opinion leaders try our product, which when you're advertising so boldly in the way we advertise, you've got to have a product that works. So when people try our product, we know that we retain the most amount of customers out of any brand in our category. So what do they do? They talk, and then they talk about that experience on social media. And as a result, we're authentic in what we're delivering, and, and that's created a situation where we're, you know, we're five times bigger than any Australian brand, we're, we're three times bigger than any global brand into China, and, and two times larger than our nearest local Chinese competitor. So it's about not thinking that you're just Australia in your focus and getting out of that fear of thinking global in your mindset. Damien? Uh, for us, I think the comment that's been said by everybody so far is one of fear. And it is very confronting um, to take that, which is a very large step. You know, for us, you know, our usual decision-making process is we can engage our staff and, our, and you know, all of our resources in opening a new store or opening three new stores within Australia. And we understand what's required and we understand the potential rewards. Um, but when you're trying something novel and new that you've never tried before, there's a huge fear. And I think what the, Austra what the Australian companies need to accept is that fundamentally most, most businesses, um, the, it's, it's risk and reward. So the greater the risk that you take, potentially, and I think Radic's you know, case in point, is the greater the reward that's out there. So we had a long time debating whether or not we should take what has always been the safe route, which is let's just concentrate all our efforts, all our resources um, on opening new stores in Australia. Um, it, and then, you know, and that was all, for a long time, that seemed the most appropriate strategy. But at one point you say, well, yes, that's fantastic. We know that we open a new store and hopefully we'll trade profitably, hopefully we'll get customers, but there's a huge reward out there. And it is a riskier strategy, but the reward is materially larger. Um, and for us, the, the reason why I think we've been, you know, when we went to China initially, we weren't dragged kicking and screaming, but you know, it was Maggie and Maggie's team insistence that the Chemist Warehouse brand was already established in, chemist, in China, mm. that we were, you know, in Maggie's words, famous in China. <laughs> um, and that you know, if we came there, that just putting our brand on products, proving the provenance of the products would assist and would create a successful venture. Because I think Chinese e-commerce is still unfortunately riddled with um, counterfeit product. And what the Chinese consumer is looking for is, is a proof of provenance, something that they can say, well, I know this product is legitimate and that's what Chemist Warehouse provided and that's why we succeeded in China. So but I'll just bring it back to China for a moment. And there were some really interesting points that Damien uh, picked up when he was talking about risk and reward. I'd like um, James and Maggie to weigh in on that. We hear about the success stories, but what are some of the pitfalls that SMEs need to watch out for when they're trying to enter that e-commerce market in China? Maybe I. Okay. You go first, and then maybe James okay. can pick up. Yeah. Um, I think one of the pitfalls is that people think about Alibaba is the is the the huge marketplace. Yeah, and uh, Chinese market is a huge market. So some of the brands we think about, I, I open a store from um, on this platform, and that's I do nothing. But that still doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know. In this stage, three our clients, Chemist Warehouse, Australian Post, and uh, Swiss, why they can success? They, that's the teamwork. Mm. So that's one is the platform. We need to yeah, have the dedicated resources to support the brands. For brands, they need to have their dedicated and capable member know the company's strategy, the China's strategy, and then to work with the third party. And then the third party, you should be able to find the right third party to help you. Mm -hmm. They have the very experienced on, on our, those e-commerce platform, how to work well. And also the logistics. So several parties together, together for the teamwork is very important. 
And the second um, platform, I think, is that uh, many local merchants actually don't know uh, Chinese consumer very well. But if you want to uh, step into a new market, you need to understand the consumer's mm. um, behaviors, yeah, what their, uh, their interests, their habits, uh, their um, taste preferences, and how about the packaging, and what price they, they prefer to pay. That's also very important. But if you cannot do that, you need to find a partner to help you. Some really fantastic points. Mm. I can see a lot of no heads <laughs> nodding over that way. Would you guys like to weigh in, Damien? Yeah, look, I, I think from my perspective yeah. is, you know, we're, we're chaperoning through a lot of Australian pharma companies into China through our Alibaba, Alibaba platform, and a lot of them have been there before. So a lot of them have gone up, they've put, on a, you know, they've put up a, a flagship store in, within Tmall or whatever it may be, whatever platform they've engaged with, and there's this belief that because there's 1.4 billion people, 600 million engaged with Alibaba on a regular platform, that simply planting my flag is going to lead to success. But the problem is that your flag is planted in and amongst 500 million other flags. Everyone's already put that flag out there. And I think what Radek and I and you know, what we've grown our businesses on is the fact that you don't just do something. As soon as you do it, tell people. In fact, Try and tell as many as you can. Try and tell everybody. Um, Chemical House, the, the superstar of this year's Double Eleven shopping festival. <laughs> Go on, tell us. Yeah, maybe you can I tell. Want me to, oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's your plug. So 10 seconds. I'm not sure how many people are versed in the Singles Day Double Eleven sale. That's a large online sale event which is run by Alibaba. Um, we joined the Timor Global Platform about the 1st of November last year, so 2015. Um, so when we got to Singles Day, our first Singles Day, 2015, we'd only been up for, I think, nine days at the time. And we were the number one site on Timor Global on Singles Day in terms of transactions on that day, um, which we we're really proud of. But we decided that the efforts of that day could be bettered. So we really reinvested this year. We invested heavily in marketing. Heavily, heavily, we sent two and a half thousand pallets worth of stock mm. over to our bonded warehouses in China, and we were the first ever um, non-Chinese retailer to do 100 million RMB in the single day on, on Singles Day. <laughs> so we, we set ourselves a very <laughs> lofty target, um, and we made it with 49 minutes to go. So we just scraped in. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was, it, it was an, again, it wasn't simply a matter of going on, yeah. putting a Chemist Warehouse brand on their website and just crossing our fingers and hoping. Yeah. Um, we invested a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort in actually generating those sales. It sounds like the key themes that are coming across are, are teamwork and collaboration and not just relying on the sheer market size. Would you guys like to weigh in, Megan? I can see you, you know, agreeing vehemently with this. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think understanding the zeitgeist is the challenge for every business, but understanding too that the customer changes and being adaptable and flexible and agile enough to change with their changing need states and, and bringing, to business, uh, bringing the business to them in the context of their daily lives as well. Um, so active marketing, active participation, but also um, M-commerce is crucial, absolutely crucial use of um, mobile. Um, in, in China, uh, far exceeds the use of, you know, in America, most um, purchases made through e-commerce e is 50% um, use mobiles. In China versus 30% in US, people who use the inter um, internet via mobiles in China uh, is the same as Brazil, US, and Indonesia combined. Mm. You know, it's just extraordinary. So, so actually, um, and, and understanding the millennials, the, the, the largest generation um, in history, 75% of our workforces by 2025 are going to be millennials. How do they think these people are digital natives? Gaming, they absolutely love gaming. Mm. They love messaging. So talk to them in the context of how they move and how they think as well be where they want to be and, and make it better, exceed their expectations. And Scott, this is a, sp a space that you're working in a lot. You work a lot with fintech companies. <coughs> yes, and I, I sort of dropped to a personal experience. Uh, until Malison's merged with King & Wood, the leading Chinese law firm, we, we, we struggled like 
anything else in, in China. Um, next week I'm travelling to China, I get the point about being chaperoned. I will be chaperoned by what, one or two of my 150 Chinese partners. They will make sure that I present things in a Chinese way. Customers are local, even though strategies are global. Yeah. And that is really important. And that, that point I made earlier, for example, in relation to uh, digital identity, which I mentioned was such an important thing, that is something which is absolutely critical to get right for each country because each country has its own view of the way that they will accept that. But together, we need it all to work together. So we need the cultures of the different countries to respond together. And the setting of standards for that is really what governments can assist with. So I, I endorse the views entirely that uh, you, you need to respond to the culture of the customer in the place where you are. Um, Ahmed, I'm going to direct this one to you. We're seeing the importance of e-commerce being coupled with a brick and mortar approach. Is that something that, that you're seeing as well? And, and what do you think is driving this trend? Yeah, I think so. I, 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 I think Australia was a little bit unusual in its uh, foundations of growth in e-commerce. Uh, if I look at uh, um, the Australian marketplace and I look at the uh, top sellers of e-commerce over the last four or five years as they've built up, they've tended to be more pure plays than the bricks and mortar players. So your traditional retailers, they all shunned away from it and they, um, at their peril, um, and they basically uh, said this was another tulip bubble, you know, phenomenon, it's going to go away, it's going to go away, or requested uh, the government impose, you know, all sorts of uh, penalties for e-commerce. And that was a, um, a pretty silly approach because at the end of the day, um, all around the world, engaging in e-commerce was always going to be the way to go. And so, but what you saw happening more recently, which is a bit more similar to what's happening in the United States or in the UK and um, actually um, uh, many other G20 type nations is um, the, uh, the bricks and mortar strategy um, is starting now to weigh in. And, and the best example of that is click and collect. Yeah. Um, so the click and collect model is an example where people will buy something online, they go to the store, they collect it and they go back into the store. And, and the rule of thumb that people have found is that click and collect, you tend to find that your, uh, your value is higher of a person who is click and collect than it is pure online click and deliver. We have this thing called collect at post, whereby we can encourage um, citizens and small businesses to say, think of the post office network as yours, as your shop front. If you want to engage in an online and a real world, then there is an opportunity to do that. And we're actually seeing that model replicated in some other countries. So, so you don't have to feel at a disadvantage if you're a pure online retailer. There are partners that you could work with that can bring those two models together. Maggie, tell us why Alibaba has decided to, to invest more in brick and mortar businesses, almost go the other way. Um, I think omni-channel uh, retailing in China is very much sure already. A lot of business will be using the omni-channel to promote. In last century, actually, a lot of business like to build up the bricks and the um, mortar stores. But nowadays, yeah, people just don't want to blindly to make those decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you know, the Double Eleven Shopping Festival, we generated about 657 million parcels. And one day, a huge, it's so about 17.8 billion US dollar, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of merchants will use the omni channel, so like the uh, click and, and, and the collect, and using for, for, from the uh, offline uh, markets. And also, some um, um, business were using the, the offline for, 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 for consumers to, to purchase and to go to their store and uh, purchase online. Mm. And also a lot of um, um, offline stores were using the, their store to do the after sales. So that's very important thing. Yeah, so we, we were just uh, using, for, for Australian market actually, you know, a lot of brands were using Timor Global to test water first. Mm. They want to go to China market to, to, to build up the off, offline um, store directly. I think for um, Swiss, as an example, actually, um, before they open the store from in Timor Global, actually our platform, uh, like our infrastructure, our big data is like infrastructure. 
So we have already know the products from Swiss, the brands, it's the, already the most well, welcome the products, the vitamin products in China market. So they can, you know, oh, if you go to the market, I can be successful. It's possible to be right. success. And you're not necessary to, to open the store in front, in the store, offline, offline store everywhere. But you, you don't know where are your consumers are. But after you testing order on the, on the website, according to the big data, you know where your consumers are located, who they are, what's the age, what's the gender. And then you decided to invest for the offline store. You are smart. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our fantastic <laughs>